Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for uh, thanks for attending. Uh, we're welcome, welcome. We're going to give this uh, webinar on general intellectual property issues and specifically IP issues for government contractors. Uh, my name is Sai Alba. I'm a, a partner in a government contracts group, and I'm here with my colleague, Kimmy. I'm Kimmy Murakami, and I'm a member of the business and corporate group. And so we're going to go through a few issues. I think Kimmy's going to start out talking about some of the general intellectual property issues that come up from more of the pure corporate perspective. And then I'll get into the GovCon specific issues under data rights and things of that nature and some of the FAR, DFARs, and all the, the rules that, that deal with that and how to sort of how to protect yourself going forward. Um, and just a little bit about us. Um, we're both attorneys here at Pluromaza. We're a, a full-service law firm, and mainly focusing on uh, federal clients, uh, federal government contractors, or tend to be our most of our clients. Uh, however, we have Pure Corporate, which is where where Kimmy does most of her work, and we also have some labor and employment and litigation uh, expertise. So we work as sort of a in-house general counsel for or out outside general counsel rather for a lot of our clients. So without further ado, we will continue with the webinar. So as I said, thank you very much for joining us. We're excited today to speak to you about intellectual property issues relevant to government contractors. Uh, we're hoping this webinar will be like a quick smart, if you will, a highlight of some IP issues that we want you to have on your radar um, just so you can manage the IP of your company well. Um, but of course, it's not going to be an in-depth uh, discussion, and we hope that you'll call or email us, or even through the webinar, you can um, ask us any questions that you might have. And if we don't get to all your questions uh, during the webinar today, we'll be sure to either contact you or send you an email uh, after the webinar is finished. So as I said, I'm going to do a quick overview about intellectual property. Uh, the major types of intellectual property, particularly those issues we see frequently for government contractors. And then Sai will be going um, into a more in-depth discussion about data rights, um, which I consider to be kind of a specialized area of intellectual property, if you will, uh, here for government contractors, uh, because it discusses what kind of licenses that the U.S. government will have in intellectual property that's developed when you're performing your contracts. So, so I will go in more detail um, about that. So starting out, um, I just want to cover a little bit about what we're talking about. Intellectual property is um, products or creations of the mind to which you have ownership rights. These are intangible assets of your companies. And having a strong IP portfolio is very, very valuable for your company, and that's why it's so important to be protecting it. Intellectual property has significant economic importance to your company, and that's why we're glad you're participating here in this webinar, so that you have um, some basis of ideas of those things that you should be doing to protect uh, your intellectual property. Different types of intellectual property, of course, the big three are trademarks, copyrights, and patents. But what we see most frequently for government contractors is the area of trade secrets. Um, and most recently, and I'm going to get into this more during the webinar, there's a new trade secret law that was just enacted uh, last month. So we really want to make sure that we bring you up to date on that and let you know um, a little bit about that and what you should be looking for and changes that you need to make to address that as well. So starting out, let's talk about trademarks. A trademark is a word or a phrase or a design that identifies certain goods or services. And all of you have a trademark because your company name um, is a trademark that has certain rights associated with it. A tagline, some of you have taglines, that can also be trademarked, as well as logos. I see all of your emails, for example, in your signature blocks. A lot of you have design elements that are part of your um, company name, and that as well can be trademarked. When your company first started and was using uh, its company name uh, for in commerce and going into business, 
That first use of the company name is when trademark rights first started to affix or arise um, with the use of your company name. Those trademark rights, when you started using the company name, are for a particular territory or geography, if you will, um, in that particular state or region. And some states even have trademark uh, registration that you can do in the state. Those initial kind of rights that I'm talking about are, as I've written here on the slide, are known as common law rights. Um, and, and so just using your company's name in commerce has started uh, the beginning of your ownership or trademark rights in your name. We would also strongly suggest and recommend that you start using in any printed materials um, a symbol like a TM symbol, that's what's used for goods, or an SM symbol, superscript uh, for services. Because again, this is a way of asserting in the public, asserting in commerce, that you have ownership in that name. There's also what you're very familiar with, which is federal trademark registration. That's when, after you get federal trademark registration, you can start using the R in a circle symbol. You cannot use that symbol unless you have a federally registered uh, trademark with the United States Patent and Trademark Office, or known as the USPTO. Um, that process for filing um, for federal trademark registration is one that we do often for clients. Um, it can begin uh, with an online filing. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about, uh, you'll, you'll uh, answer some questions for me and we'll talk a little bit about your mark. We'll identify some classes or industries uh, in which you do or perform your government contract services. Um, and after filing that, it takes about three months before we'll get questions back from the PTO, from a trademark examiner. Those questions are known as an office action. We have six months to respond to that. Uh, and then hopefully our response will satisfy the examiner's questions and he'll publish your mark um, in a PTO publication known as the Official Gazette. And after a 30-day protest period, uh, then you would get your uh, federally registered trademark. So generally, the process takes about uh, 9 to 12 months. And um, once you have that federal trademark registration, that would allow you, for example, to sue for trademark infringement um, in federal court. So there are definitely advantages to um, filing for trademark registration. And again, we're happy to help you with that. Um, and I guess I should go back. I realized I skipped over uh, what a trademark is not. And I, I bring this up because there's been some confusion sometimes with clients where they think they might have already registered uh, their trademark, for example, because when they did the filing of forming their company, for example, at the state level, and you filed your uh, certificate of formation or your articles of organization, at that time, you're not doing anything with respect to getting your trademark registered. Uh, you're also, uh, when you register your domain name uh, for your websites, uh, again, while domain names could be trademarked, if you will, um, filing your registration for your domain name, like with GoDaddy or one of those companies, is not doing your federal trademark registration. So I just wanted to point out um, a few of those things where it can get confusing, where um, clients have thought, oh, no, I already have a registered trademark, and they haven't actually done that process. So um, trademarks is, you know, very, very important. But again, like I was saying, most commonly we see for our clients, is the area of, of trade secrets. So what is a trade secret? A trade secret is your secret sauce, if you will. It's the recipe for Coca-Cola, for example. A trade secret under the laws that we're always reading and looking at um, is something where you've taken reasonable measures to keep it secret. And we're going to talk about what the, some of those measures are and that the information derives economic value from not being known to others. So having value or um, being very proprietary to your company and what you do is what is necessary in order to have what constitutes a trade secret. Protecting trade secrets um, is done under state law and that's because in almost all states, about 40, I think it's in Massachusetts and New York that haven't, all states have adopted um, some form of the Uniform Trade Secrets Act. And 
what I was alluding to earlier when we started about um, the new federal law is this past May, on May 11th, the president just signed into law what is known as the Defend Trade Secrets Act. Um, and this is really important and will really change um, the law in the fe uh, trade secrets area. This law, amongst other things, allows for a civil cause of action to be brought in federal courts for the misappropriation of trade secrets. It doesn't take away or get rid of anything uh, with respect to state law actions, but it's providing this new um, opening of doors, if you will, to the federal courts uh, for misappropriation of trade secrets. There are a lot of um, other, uh, I don't want to say controversial, but other things in this new law that we'll just have to see how they play out. Uh, for example, there's ex parte seizure, uh, which involves being able to uh, try and stop someone from disclosing more of what you feel is your trade secrets. There are notification requirements in this new law having to do with whistleblower protection for employees when they want to um, bring to the attention uh, some of the things that they might think that you're doing that's not appropriate and that they have to disclose trade secrets in the process. So there are going to be um, changes that are going to be need to be addressed as a result of this law. And as we do quite frequently at our firm, we'll be sending out blogs and client alerts uh, with information about that and writing articles on it. Um, so there isn't, in contrast to what I described as that federal uh, trademark registration process, there is no federal registration process with the USPTO uh, for trade secrets. Uh, so that's something that's very different and makes this area a uh, little bit more interesting, if you will, as to how you protect your trade secrets. For those of you who are government contractors, which is most of you, I've tried to specify here, um, in case you're wondering, is something a trade secret? A few examples of things that I, I know you all have that might constitute, such as financial business scientific, scientific technical um, information, uh, formulas, um, other proprietary information used in your business that you wouldn't want your competitors to know about, and that is proprietary to you, in other words, that you derive uh, value from. Um, some of the factors. Oh, yeah, there's just, just one one thing I wanted to add. Whenever we said that there's there's no protection for trade secrets under the, the federal space, there's no protection per se by the virtue of something being a trade secret. But if the trade secret is something that's patentable or, or copyrightable, then in those cases there would be potential federal protections under those regimes, but not by virtue of merely being a trade secret. Right, or registering it. And again, now we have this new uh, DTSA, if you will, the new law that I spoke of, which again is going to provide more federal pr protection for your trade secrets. Um, so again, as we were just discussing in the government contract space, examples of trade secrets are your pricing information, your pricing strategies, uh, your marketing plans, uh, business and financial information, bidding policies and procedures, and some of your price lists. So again, I'm trying to point these things out so you're being vigilant and cognizant of what information needs to be protected in your company. Trade secrets are not uh, information that's in the general knowledge or that can be acquired publicly. It does not include skills or abilities necessary um, to perform the job that your employees come in with. But part of protecting your trade secrets is making sure that your employees know what information is a trade secret in your company and that they know what measures they need to be taking and what policies are in place uh, in your company for protecting it. So, of course, in your contracts, uh, we want to make sure that there are restricted covenants and other provisions protecting trade secrets. These should be in your employment agreements, in your um, independent contractor agreements, your NDAs. You should always be thinking about NDAs when you're disclosing uh, confidential or proprietary information. Um, and also, of course, in your teaming agreements, in your subcontracts, and we're going to be getting into more of that as well. Another way of protecting your trade secrets is um, restrictive restrictions that you should have and different security controls uh, that are in place at your company. 
legends. For example, are you classifying your data and certain information? Is it highly confidential or is it just protected or is it publicly available information? Um, there should be policies and procedures in place known as like your security policy um, that go to what information employees are allowed to put onto personal computers and what information uh, is protected at your company and whether or not they're allowed to copy it. Um, there should also be procedures in place on what information is disclosed to certain employees. There should be certain types of information should only be disclosed to those who need to know that information. There should also be policies with respect to employees uh, keeping certain information and what happens to it and when it needs to be destroyed after they've had uh, the privilege of knowing that information and have learned about it. So all of this falls into the category of training the employees and making sure they understand what is a trade secret at your company. Oh yeah, and, and one other thing to add about um, employees and what they can keep on certain devices and things of that nature. In certain states, take for instance Oregon, there are very, very uh, liberal rules with regard to employees and the rights that they have on or over company provided equipment, like say a cell phone. And in Oregon and in certain other states, mainly on the West Coast, if they put certain personal information on those devices, it limits the employer's ability to access those devices. And so if you allow an employee to put something that is protected, so trade secret or the like, on one of those devices, then you may not be able to control it as easily, say after you terminate the person or the person goes on extended sick leave and you want that device back, you can't simply demand it back or simply sort of remotely access the device and start wiping things because you might be potentially violating certain state laws. So just be aware of that. Okay, and also when these employees are, are leaving, the exit interviews are very important. Making sure you get back those devices, making sure they just destroy certain information that or documents that they have, um, or remind them about the restrictive covenants that they have in their employment agreements, for example, how long the restrictive period is, and uh, make sure they fully understand what restrictions they, um, even though they're leaving, what restrictions are going to continue in their behavior with regard to their behavior uh, with disclosing and using um, certain information. And again, this all falls under the category of vigilance. This is the kind of thing where once the toothpaste is out of the tube, if you will, it's something that can't go back in the tube. So it's very, very important uh, that you're taking certain measures to protect uh, your trade secrets. Yeah, and then just uh, one quick thing too, if you fail to protect your trade secrets, you can actually lose any sort of state protection that you had. So it's important to keep on top of all this stuff, even if something would be a trade secret by its very nature, if you fail to protect it, you could lose that protection entirely. Okay, so we covered uh, trademarks, trade secrets, uh, a third category um, is copyrights. I just wanted to mention here that with copyrights, once a work of authorship is uh, fixed into medium, like written down, um, then automatically you have copyright ownership in that, that, that work of authorship. So copyright, in contrast to the other areas I was just discussing, it automatically arises as soon as you commit this work of authorship or fix it to a particular kind of medium. So again, registration is not required in order to, for you to have copyright um, rights in it. Um, so I was just pointing to the bottom of uh, the slide that you're looking at. You can see our copyright notice there. There are three elements of a copyright notice. Uh, the first is that C in a circle, or it could be the word copyright. Um, and the second element is the name of the owner of the copyright and the third element is the year of um, when it's first published. Uh, generally for something like this it's going to be the year when it's created. On websites I've seen recently that people are putting down like a whole range of years like 2003-2016. Um, so that's why we're bringing up copyrights for 
because we're government contractors, we know you all have a website, and it's very important that you include a copyright notice there. Copyrights, like the other areas of intellectual property law I was talking about, also have common law uh, rights, and it is possible to do federal registration for copyrights, and there is some uh, works that should be absolutely registered, and you should do federal registration, like certain aspects or parts of software, for example, that we'll be getting into uh, during this webinar as well. Um, and there are advantages to doing federal registration of copyrights. Again, being able to bring an infringement uh, lawsuit in federal court. Um, it also establishes a public record. Um, if there is going to be a lawsuit of someone claiming that they have or they own something, uh, if you have registered um, and done federal registration of your copyright, it is evidence of when your date of ownership has actually begun, uh, particularly if you get involved in a lawsuit and there's a dispute over that. Um, so going to like something germane to all of you um, with your website, um, ways of protecting it. One is the notice, which we were just discussing. Um, trademark your name and your logo as I uh, started this presentation out with. Um, of course, protect your trade secrets. Don't disclose anything on your website that is patentable. And make sure that also when you're looking at your competitors' websites that you're enforcing your own IP-protected information. If you see that a competitor or somebody else has um, something on their website that you believe is yours, that you have IP rights in, then be vigilant. Uh, notify them or notify us, and we will help you um, in taking steps to make sure they take that down and that you send them a cease and desist letter and take other actions necessary for protecting uh, your IP protected information. Because it, what Ty said is if you don't, you're going to lose your rights. So being vigilant and protecting your IP information is very, very important. The fourth category of IP, the big one, is uh, patents. And a patent is obtained, patent rights is you can only get pat a patent by filing with an application with the USPTO. There are not common law uh, patent protections like what I was describing for the other areas or types of IP. So for a patent, you have to get a patent lawyer and you need to file a patent application with the USPTO. Now that's not to say that patent law issues don't come up in the context of government contracts. Uh, they do. And so this is some of what kind of, if you will, like a on the fence issue of what size good, I'm going to turn this over to Sai and he's going to start talking about is uh, how patent law issues really arise in the context of government contracts. Um, in the FAR, there's a definition of what is a subject invention, um, subject to um, a patent, and that is something that's conceived or reduced to practice while performing or under the contract. Um, there are regulations that describe the how the contractor must disclose the invention. Uh, you have to make an election as to whether or not to retain title or whether or not you're going to grant the government a license. Um, and so those are, again, some of the issues that Sai is going to get into more detail about. And there's also this extraordinary thing called march-in rights, where the government can march in and force a contractor, the contractor holding the patent uh, to it, and force the contractor to license it to other third parties. Uh, recently, Sai wrote a blog about this. Uh, we've never really seen this uh, enforced. Uh, it can only happen in extraordinary circumstances, and there have been extraordinary circumstances where we thought the government would march in and force uh, the contract holder, the contractor, to grant a license, but the government did not. So um, we haven't really seen cases where this has been exercised, but it's important, again, just to know that this could happen. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to Sai, who's going to get into these issues and a little bit more about um, data rights. Thank you, Kimmy. Um, yeah, and, and with regard to, to marching rights, the example that Kimmy was referring to is uh, the most extreme example that I'm, I'm aware of is there was a specific medication that was developed to prevent a relatively rare illness and uh, in that situation, it, the patent holder 
wasn't actually creating the product. And so people were getting sick and potentially dying from this illness. And certain other companies petitioned the government. And by the way, this was developed under a federal contract. It was a subject invention. And um, so the government had these rights because generally they don't have the rights. It's only if they sort of paid for the development. Uh, and the government refused to step in, saying this is an extraordinary remedy, uh, and that in that sort of scenario, it wasn't something where they felt it necessitated them to exercise that authority. So unless, I mean, people were dying in that case. So it's it's pretty rare. I mean, in the, the blog article I put together, I, I essentially said that. This march in rights isn't necessarily something to be worried about. Um, sometimes people see it, though, and, and panic or, or uh, they don't understand it. And they ask questions and they, they want to know more about it. And it's one of those gut powers the government has, but they don't really use it. It never comes to execution. So it's just something to be aware of. Um, other, otherwise, so outside of the, the patent realm, then there's the other realm for, for federal contract purposes is under data rights. And so you've got some provisions in the FAR, some provisions in the DFAR. There is overlap, but they're not identical. So it's important to understand the, the differences, things like that. We'll go into that soon. Um, and there's different types of data that are covered under these things. There's technical data, and then there's computer software, both non-commercial and commercial. And different types of rights as well, which are listed here, and we'll go into more detail. The, the key thing, whether you're talking about data or software, whatever your, your product happens to be, whatever item, is when it was actually developed. And that's defined un, under the FAR and, and DFAR so that whenever something is sort of reduced to practice, similar to the definition back here of subject inventions, once something is reduced to practice, um, that is whenever the rights for all parties, the government and the contractor, those rights attach at that moment in time. So, and reduced to practice is reduced at the lowest practicable level. So if you have some sort of software and you sort of develop the software and it does one particular task, and then later you have certain iterations of that where it adds more tasks, let's say the initial software was, was produced under a federal contract and you did none of that uh, development at private expense or at your own time, then those items would generally be items that the government would have unlimited rights in. And we'll get to that soon. But what that means. But if you did later iterations of it or you did other you created other functions for that software later at private expense outside of federal procurements, then those later items or modules or whatever you want to call them would be developed later in time. And so the government would never have those have rights to that. Or take, for example, something that was developed, if you were developing all of those, starting to develop all of those things, all the modules, the entire piece of software while under the federal contract, but those other modules weren't actually reduced to practice and were not really functioning, then even though the government may have invested or you may have taken federal dollars to produce start to produce those, you didn't actually develop them with federal funding. And so the, you, keeping track of when it was actually developed is critical because that's when the rights attach. Even if you can't separate something module to module, if you look at the sort of compiled code and say you add things to make the code more efficient or something like that, and I just use software as an example because it's easier, but it, this applies to non-software technical data as well. But if you say, change the code and make it more efficient or take less processing power, or work faster, or whatever, those changes would also, if you did them at, at your own private expense, would not be something that would fall under the government's rights because you didn't develop them during a contract. You didn't reduce them to practice um, while you were being paid by the government or under the federal contract. So it's important to just keep track of when that, that trigger occurs. Especially under, under the DFARS, you, the real key thing is who paid for it, right? So if, if the government fully funded something, they're going to get unlimited rights. If 
you fully funded it or it's fully funded out of your GNA overhead uh, just profit, then those sorts of items you have the most ability to retain the rights on. And if it's done both at government and at private expense, to the extent you can drill down to the lowest practicable level of what items were done at private expense, what items or parts were done at government expense, then you can divvy up the rights to those things. However, if there's no way to discern when your creation, your development started and the, and the government stopped or, or vice versa, then you could in theory have something that was developed at mixed funding and that's treated differently depending on whether you're under the FAR or under the DFAR. We'll get into that in a minute. This is just a list of the key, sort of the main clauses that things come up in or disputes or questions. And so I just wanted to list them in here and we'll get into what these mean in a minute. So obviously the FAR provisions don't apply to DOD. You have to go with the DFARS regime and there are differences. Um, for instance, as I referred to before, this mixed funding issue. If you cannot discern where the government's funding for a particular item started and where the private funding ended or vice versa, in that sort of scenario, under the FAR, the government gets unlimited rights, which basically means they don't own it. You still own it, but they have the rights to duplicate it, provide it to other contractors to do work with, uh, essentially anything they want at no further cost to the government. Whereas under the DFARS regime, so for DOD contracts, the government doesn't get unlimited rights. They get government purpose rights, which, which is close to unlimited rights, except it only applies to intra-government actions. So under unlimited rights, they could in theory give it to another contractor um, to duplicate and maybe even take and add to and, and, and develop at no other cost. Whereas for government purpose rights, they can't give it to a contractor for that contractor to use unless the contractor is using it just on another federal procurement for, for DOD. So that's where there is a slight difference or could be a substantial difference depending on the value of the item. But there is a difference between the FAR and the, the DFARs. Um, certain types of data, we kind of went over this with technical data, there's com computer software. Databases are generally considered, in most cases, considered to be technical data, not considered to be computer software. And computer software documentation as well normally falls under the technical data gambit. So this is just a, a definition of technical data. It's essentially any recorded information of a scientific or technical nature that's not software. Uh, so if you have some processes or procedures that, that you've developed that uh, you consider to be proprietary or um, starting to develop plans on how to build a better mousetrap, those sorts of documents and documentation are things that would be considered technical data. Um, sort of anything of value and of a technical nature that, that's reduced in some form to writing uh, could, could be considered technical data. Computer software is just what it sounds like. It's basically computer software, um, any information that is colloquially known as software and could be run on a system after it's compiled. And there's non-commercial, or com like, well, commercial first. Commercial software is things that you just sell to the general public or in the federal marketplace. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you sell it all the time to a bunch of buyers in the com complete commercial space. You could have something that's commercial computer software that you've developed and say you sell it on the GSA schedule. It, if you're developing it for, not, for something other than a very specific use for a specific customer, then that could be considered commercial software. And so all the commercial software rules would, would apply. Um, if you're developing software that's very specific to a customer, that would be where something would be considered non-commercial software. Uh, or if you have commercial software and you're developing modules or add-ons to it for a very specific customer, then those add-ons or additions could be considered the non-commercial portion and you'd follow the non-commercial software rules versus the commercial software which had been developed 
previously. And different rights can, can attach depending on whenever that was developed using the definition we talked about earlier. So this is the, the most important piece, is talking about w what rights do you get. What rights do you get? What rights to the, does the government get? And remember, all of these types of rights we're going to go into, they attach whenever the item is developed. So whenever you're talking about rights, so we're always talking about license rights. We're not talking about ownership. Generally speaking, ownership stays with the contractor who developed the item. So even if the government paid for 100% of something, generally speaking, the government should only be taking unlimited rights in the, in the item. They should not be taking ownership rights. And that comes out of a, a change uh, years ago where it was looked at where the old rule, it's like 50 plus years ago, the old rule was that the government kept ownership in everything it paid for. And the way Congress and the public started to look at that is that those items were sort of going to waste. The government wasn't in the business of taking things and commercializing it or using it for the good of humanity, so to speak. They would just keep these things in a vault, and unless they needed it, it would just sit in that vault. And if they needed it, they'd pull it out and use it for something. Um, now, yes, in theory, that could save the government money because then they would have complete ownership and title to everything that they paid for. Um, but the way Congress and the public looked at it is that that's not in the public interest. It's, it's harming the public. And so the rules were then changed and the whole policy behind things were changed so that the government would no longer have ownership in, in any IP, even if it paid for it. It should only have license rights in it. And that comes from mainly the, the Bayh-Dole Act, but the the sort of precursors to this whole thing happened prior to that, mainly in the, the early 70s. So the, the Bayh-Dole Act basically says what I just stated, particularly for small businesses. There's a number of provisions in the Bayh-Dole Act basically saying that small businesses have extra protection. They can't be forced to give up ownership in things even if they are a subcontractor to a large business prime contractor. Under the Bayh-Dole Act, the large business prime contractor cannot force the small business to give up its ownership rights in IP developed under any federal procurement where this act applies. And so they, they can voluntarily give it up. And most of the time, that's a distinction without a difference because it's sort of, hey, do you want this contract or do you not want the contract? It's up to you. If you don't want the contract, then don't give up the rights. And you know, essentially, you never even get to develop to, to begin with because you don't ever have the funds to do it. Or accept the contract and give up your rights. And that sort of, you know, some people would call it financial distress or potential distress, isn't something that's prohibited under the Buy Dole Act. But if, if a large company or even another small business, tries to put extreme pressure on you or force you or make threats after you've already started the contract or something like that to give up your rights, that's actually a violation of this act. Another thing that's important to, to note is from either the, in the federal space or just generally, that whenever you are creating something within your company, chances are there's an individual, there's some human being that's actually doing the creating. And those, in, those individuals, those inventors, actually will maintain the rights to everything they create, even if they're doing it under your employ. And so what you need to, what you need to worry about there is how you phrase the agreements that you have with these employees such that they give the rights to the company whenever these things are, are produced. So if you have an agreement with one of your employees that says anything you develop, you, you will assign the rights to, right? Yes. That is not enough. Because if you're saying you will do something, you're implying they're going to do something in the future, okay. but then they're not actually doing it at the time they sign that. And so later, whenever they take that item they developed and they go make millions and millions of dollars off of it because they leave your company and market it, you have no rights. You have no recourse. So what you need to have is some language in these documents you have with these employees that's saying they, for instance, at the bottom here, they do hereby assign or grant the rights to the company right now. So 
they're they're already right now assigning the rights to anything that they do in the future. Not that they will do it, but that they are doing it. That, that's the important distinction there. So when we're dealing with the types of rights, we have limited rights, unlimited rights, restricted rights, government purpose rights. So when you're talking about limited rights, that's used in the FAR and, and the, the DFAR. It applies only to technical data. Uh, the similar thing for commercial software is called restricted rights. We'll get into that in a second. And as we noted earlier, the protection is triggered once you develop that technical data. So if the technical data is developed and you do it yourself, it's not under a federal contract or with funding from, a, from some sort of federal source, then you've developed it at private expense and you can assert limited rights, you can assert rights in it and give the government only limited rights in any future contract you have with the government because you're essentially bringing that IP to the table. You're not developing it within the federal contract, you're bringing it in. And in order to assert these rights, you need to make sure that at the time you deliver anything and even at the outset of the contract with any, any of this technical data you're bringing into the contract or using on the contract, you need to have labeled appropriately with the, in, the language from the applicable FAR or DFARS provision. If you use different language, then it can be considered non-compliant um, uh, tag, right? And if, if you have this non-compliant tag, then what happens is you, you risk losing your, your rights to that or losing the ability rather to limit the government's rights. And the government would take unlimited rights in, in that item. And effectively, if you put a legend on there that's not the appropriate legend from the FAR, from, from the DFAR, the contracting officer can let you fix it, but they're not required to let you fix it. So it's important to make sure you do it right the first time. Um, generally speaking, limited rights, they can, within the government, they can modify it, release it, they can you know, put it on in some performance, which would essentially be if you have some technical data specs or some sort of blueprint and they're using it in a presentation to others within the government, that's okay. And they can disclose it to other people within the government, right? They can't use it to manufacture things and they can't use it or disclose it outside of the government. Um, most of the time, when you're talking about not disclosing outside the government, the government would like to use it to disclose potentially to another contractor to have them do follow-on work or further development work. And if they only have limited rights, they can't take that position. Restricted rights deals with computer software, and it's essentially the same sort of protections that uh, fall under the limited rights under technical data, um, and it's the same sort of thing applies. If you develop the software at private expense outside of a federal procurement, then you can establish yourself as being the main owner, and you can limit the government's rights by restricting them, uh, and it's only for computer software. So. The, the difference between software and technical data is some of these specifics. So with restric restricted rights, the, the government can take this software and they, they can use it and they can transfer it to other agencies. So if you buy, say, one CD that, of whatever the software is, you can install it on one computer and you can use it. And unless they get, they have paid for the additional licenses to use them on other computers, they're not allowed to install it on other computers. Further, if they take that CD and send it to a different agency so that they can use it, the first agency has to get it off their computer systems, destroy any record they have of it, so that there's only one sort of copy of that software that's being used because the way it's viewed is that the government only paid for one license of it. So similar to the way commercial software works for in the general marketplace, if you buy Windows, um, to, unless the license is otherwise, you can only install it on one computer and use it on one computer. Government purpose rights are used actually only in defense contracts, is only under the under the, the DFARS, and it applies to both non-commercial technical data and computer software, but only if it's developed at mixed funding and, as we noted earlier, only in those instances where it's impossible to discern where one funding source began 
and another started, or where one ended and another started. So this is actually something that comes up pretty rarely because most of the time when you dig down to the lowest level or lowest component level of any either software or technical data, you can, if you're tracking it correctly while you're in the development process, you can show where your development with your funding ended and where the government kicked in or vice versa. And in that case, you would never fall into this mixed funding bag. You would always be able to delineate those separate rights. Um, so it's only in those situations where you cannot do that where this really applies. And when you're talking about unlimited rights, generally, if you don't put a legend on the software or technical data that you're giving to the government, and if the government or, or the government paid for everything completely all the way through the development stage, then the government will take unlimited rights. And this is this is supposed to be the the largest rights pool that the government is allowed to take. Ownership is, is beyond this. Ownership gives you more than unlimited rights because you can do anything with it. Whereas unlimited rights is you can use it in an unlimited manner, but you never own it. You can't sell it to someone. Um, you know, you can't take it and commercialize it, right? But with unlimited rights, what the government can do is they can give it to other contractors for like a follow-on contract. And those other contractors can take it, can modify, can add to it. And for those modifications, they can even commercialize those other modifications. So it's when the government takes unlimited rights in something, it can be – it can really take sort of the wind out of, out of, out of your sails as far uh, – as far as being able to protect yourself and protect your either computer computer software or technical data. What it what it doesn't do though is affect your ownership rights. You always have the ownership rights if you developed it. So you can sell it, you can commercialize it, you can add to it, you can do anything you want to it. The only thing this means is that you can't restrict the government from doing certain things. So you never give up your ownership rights. Now, I understand in certain contracts, I've seen it come up more often where the government is trying to assert ownership rights, and, and they can put that sort of thing in contracts, but the, the government is not supposed to be doing that as the Bayh-Dole Act and, and general policies are supposed to heavily lean against that because it's not in the public interest for the government to take ownership over, over any of these types of IP. Um, and so when you're talking about these things, obviously, if, it, the, if it's developed purely at government expense, they can take unlimited rights in it. Form, fit, and function data is essentially if you give them something. Let's say you put together some uh, server array for them, and they need, to do, they need to maintain it, and they need to maybe add or remove parts to it, that sort of stuff. All the sort of manuals on how all that things, all that works, that's generally your form, fit, and function data. And for that, even if you, the government has restricted rights to certain software or limited rights to the technical data uh, to develop or put together that, that, that server array, the information needed to maintain it is not restricted because they need to be able to give that, hand that to maybe a maintenance contractor to come in and do the maintenance on that work. But your IP in the meat and potatoes of that item are still protected. Okay, yeah. Um, so again, one of the main things is how was the development funded, right? And when, when was the actual item developed under under the FAR. So as we noted before, development is the key and what funding went into the development of which components is really the, is really the, the key aspect there. When you're talking about prime contractor versus subcontractor, often what you see is that the prime contractor requires the subcontractor to give up all rights as Everything that the subcontractor does is a work for hire. Um, that's very common and generally okay. Now, as we noted before, if there's a small business subcontractor that has ownership in certain IP, you, in theory, there's limits to how much you can force them to give up rights. But 
if it's just a business deal, you can certainly ask them to waive their rights and to assign their rights to you as the prime contractor. And if they do so willingly, there's no violation of the buy dole act or any other other issue. Um, that said, if the some if the subcontractor has brought some technical data or software that they developed at private expense to the table, they can bypass the prime and give that data directly to the government if they want to protect their rights. So you can't necessarily force them to give up their own IP to you or go through you for certain items that are completely protected and were done outside of the contract. That's not something that uh, you're, you're allowed to do. Um, as, we, as we noted before, when you're putting different legends on your technical data or your software, you have to use ex explicitly what's in the FAR or the DFARs. If you don't, if you add language or tweak the language, it's actually not compliant. It's an, an otherwise termed non-conforming. And in that case, if it's non-conforming, as noted earlier, the contracting officer can essentially refuse to allow you to fix it, and then you've just given the government unlimited rights in that technical data or computer software. If it's an unjustified legend or marking, it means you're trying to assert rights that are prohibited under the FAR. So if the government paid for the development of something on a previous contract, yet on the next contract, you try to assert limited rights in that item, and let's say the government doesn't catch it. You, you're performing the work, you assert limited rights, and then the government doesn't uh, dispute it or doesn't say you're not allowed to at the start of the contract. And then you go through the contract and you're, everybody's working fine and the government tries to do something and then you, with that software or, or technical data, thinking that they have unlimited rights, and then you come forward and you say, no, 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 you only have limited rights. Well, then at that point, the government can look at the issue and say, no, that was not a justified marking. So we're, we, we disagree, and we don't think we have limited rights in this. We think we have unlimited rights, and we're going to do what we want to do. And at that point, you would have to go through either a, a claim route or you could, in theory, file a, a lawsuit to try to stop that from, from occurring. Um, but you'd have to go that route in order to fight whether or not something is justified or, or un, unjustified. When we talk, because because development and that time for development is so crucial, it's very important to keep careful records of the development process and knowing when certain things or items down to the lowest practical level were developed. So, or say software, if you have one piece of software and it does some function and you did it all private expense, you should be keeping track of that. Somewhere you should be note, notating within your agency, within your organization, that this software was created on X date, it did this particular thing, and this was done completely at private expense through just either profit or through our our B, our um, R and D funds, that kind of thing. And if you have that, if you have that record, you have, you're in a much stronger position if the government tries to dispute over here. If they try to say that it's unjustified because we paid for it, careful records can be brought to the to the fore in order to beat that back or dispute the government's in, intention. So. You know, when, when the data was, was developed and at the lowest practical level, keeping track of that as well. So you have to be very specific in your records so, so you know what you're trying to protect. If you're not very detailed with some of your, your records of when things were, were developed, then it raises a risk that later on the government could try to dispute that and you don't have adequate records. You might have an adequate record of when something was reduced to practice, but the specifics of what that reduction to practice entailed. What did that item do? What was the practice that it did? If you don't have that written down, it's also a risk. Um, and that generally, you know, that generally covers uh, the main issues. I know we went 
pretty quickly through a, a lot of information. But we wanted to just give you a, a good overview of some of the issues that, that can come up and and we'll, we can answer any questions that you guys might have or might, might send over on any of these topics, and we'd be happy to talk with you. So thank you very much for attending, and uh, hope you have a great rest of the day.